For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes. Lord, increase our faith. Even if we are acting like children who do not get their way. So this is my encouragement for you to seek and search the Action Bible. Hello, shalom, and God bless. Thank you guys for joining this sermon this week. Today is the day the Lord has made, so be sure to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's give thanks and praise to God with a shout of hallelujah. Praising God, Creator Most High, Creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. Uh, let's thank Him today for the gift of salvation in the one and only name, Jesus Christ. Let's thank Him today for the gift of the Holy Spirit and ask to be led by His Spirit so that we can come to complete and mutual understanding of His Word and peace, unity, and edification by that Word. Alright, so this will be the last video on Jesus' healings. We'll cover Jesus' other miracles later on. Uh, but this is the last one about his physical healings and again we see a, a man who was born blind being made able to see again now this is a great recap of jesus's healings because it encompasses almost everything that we have been learning and it's a great way to end uh, this series on jesus's healings uh, and especially w because for the next two weeks i, I won't be making videos and then after that, we'll have a fresh start with the rest of Jesus' miracles. Uh, but let's focus on the story here in John chapter 9. Let's read the words together. And we're going to read the entire chapter, so this is a long one. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Again, this is a great recap. Uh, so without further ado, let's go to the Gospels it, themselves. All right, so we're going to start with verse 1 today healing a man born blind, and this is the sixth sign that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John. So as he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's work might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said he's the one, others were saying no, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, go to walk Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he? They asked. I don't know, he said. All right, so this is just the first part of the story. We'll continue on later, but I want to kind of highlight and hit some of the points already being covered here. The disciples asked Jesus, uh, what did this man do or what did his parents do that he would be born blind? Now, in the Old Testament, this is something that happens, right? Uh, because somebody sins, uh, God says, I will punish them to the fourth generation. Uh, so let's read what God says there, but also let's read what he says about the new covenant and what he is going to do. So this is Exodus 20. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is the beginning of God's declaration of the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all of these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So what we're looking at here is very much found in verse 5. The disciples think that because the man was born blind, either his parents had sinned or he had sinned uh, to cause this blindness. But Jesus says that's not the case. He says it's, it's so that God's power might be displayed uh, before him or he, it's going to be used for God's glory, which is exactly what he speaks through his prophets. We're going to take a look at both Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So let's start with Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 27. 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the kingdom of, kingdoms of Israel and Judah with the offspring of people and of animals, just as I watch over them to uproot and tear down and to overthrow, destroy and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Everyone eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So we read here that through the prophet Jeremiah, God is declaring what the new covenant is going to be like. He says nobody, nobody is going to die for the sins of their parents. Each person is going to be responsible for their own sin. And of course, God is going to make a new covenant, wash away the sins of old, and then make us fresh new beings that are filled with the Holy Spirit and are able to keep God's commandments. So let's keep reading Jeremiah 31, 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And this is all part of the gospel, right? God is declaring that this is what he's going to do. And we see the new covenant. We see the good news even before it is enacted. Of course, Jesus comes and he shows us what this actually looks like. What it means to forgive sins. What it means to bring healing to the people. Remember, he said, I brought destruction before. Now I'm going to watch you replant. I'm going to watch you recover from this destruction that I brought from you. And we see that with the man here, with the blind man. Um, we see God's glory coming about because of this prophecy, uh, because of what God said he was going to do and is actually doing through Jesus Christ. And we'll get testimony of this from the other prophet, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4. The one who sins will die. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. And again, God gives us the new covenant through another one of his prophets. Let's read Ezekiel 36 verses 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And again, this is what Jesus is doing in the New Testament. He's going around being like the high priest. And this is symbolic of sprinkling clean water. You can go back to the law and read how the priest would do that to cleanse people. We see Jesus spit in the mud, rub it on the guy's eyes, and then he goes and washes it away. Uh, again, we see that Jesus here is the living water. He is the clean source of water that removes the impurities from these people. And through him, eventually all people, everybody who calls on his name. Uh, and then the idea here is that we receive the Holy Spirit. So we see him cleaning up Israel and, and he's preparing them all for the Holy Spirit who is going to help us keep his commandments after uh, he has departed. After Jesus has departed, the Spirit comes and helps people follow the laws and remain clean. And if you look at many different references to mud in the Old Testament, Jesus spits in the dirt, makes mud, and pour, puts it over the guy's eyes, and then he says, go and wash it away. Well, mud is very unclean, right? If you think about mud, it's, it's not something clean in and of itself, and it's symbolic of the people's uncleanliness and needing to be washed of that. Uh, let's read Psalm 40 verses 1 through 3 real quick. So I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. 
He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. So again, we read the gospel, we read the good news here in the Old Testament. God has not yet enacted it. He's still speaking through his prophets, telling of this time when it will happen. Many people are going to see this thing that God has done and put their trust in him. And they're going to fear him. They're going to have reverence for him. And he's going to pull us out of the mud. He's going to cleanse us up and put us on the straight and narrow path. So that we no longer have to bear the consequences of our ancestors. We no longer have to bear the sin of Israel that continued to disobey God. And no, no matter of righteous acts could ever cleanse them of that. We read about Hezekiah, the righteous king. We read about Josiah, the righteous king. And no amount of righteous acts these two kings could do could ever cleanse Israel from what their ancestors had already done. We needed a fresh new start with Jesus Christ. Okay, so going back and drawing back our attention back to the man who was born blind and now is able to see, he, Jesus tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And we know from last week's sermon that these bodies of water within the temple gates had running water. They were living sources of water. They were not stagnant. And people would gather at these, these waters for healing. Uh, so the Pool of Siloam is actually mentioned in the Old Testament. Let's read Nehemiah 3.15 just for historical context and to know uh, the kind of the setting here in the temple. Uh, so the fountain gate was repaired by Shalun, son of Kol, Jose, ruler of the district of Mizpah. He rebuilt it, roofing it over and putting its doors and bolts and bars in place. He also repaired the wall of the Pool of Siloam by the king's garden, as far as the steps going down from the city of David. So we read kind of where this pool is, where uh, it's got its origin at. Uh, just in case you were curious, let's kind of read on now with the story and see what happens with this man who is healed of his blindness. All right, so back to the Gospel of John. This is John 9. Let's first read verses 13 through 17. So the Pharisees investigate the healing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Much like we have read previously before, much like we read about the apostles and acts teaching and doing things on the Sabbath. Uh, again, this is a reoccurring theme and a reoccurring issue with the Pharisees. So therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I was watched and now I see some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, but for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. All right, so that is the testimony from the man. And how does he know he is a prophet? Before he said he didn't even know who Jesus was, and now he's proclaiming that he is a prophet. Well, it's because he had opened the eyes of his, his blindness. He had made a, a blind man see, and that blind man was him. Uh, so he can testify to God's works. But the Pharisees still do not see God at work. They think it's some demon or some other spirit at work. Uh, but the people here make a good um, counterpoint. How can a sinner perform such signs? Uh, the, king, the kingdom of Satan cannot be divided, right? This is what Jesus tells us. Uh, so these miracles can only be performed by God, and God usually would only work within his prophets. We read about Elijah, who does all of these miracles only by the hand of God. Uh, so Jesus, at the very least, is a prophet, but we will also read he is much more than that. So let's continue on, John 9, verses 18 through 23 now. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. 
All right, so to confirm, this is actually the man who was born blind and now can see they go to his parents because there's some confusion, right? Some say, well, it's just a man that looks like him. Some were saying, yes, that's the man. And they were divided over this. There was a debate and how do you end that? Well, you go to some uh, witnesses, right? And what better to witness uh, who this man actually is than his parents? And his parents, his parents acknowledge that he is indeed the man who was born blind, but they cannot acknowledge who did it. Uh, but he says, ask him, he will speak for himself. Uh, so they don't want to defy the Pharisees. They know that there will be consequences. Uh, and this is a little bit of unrighteous action from the parents. Uh, they could testify to what had happened, but instead, because of their fear, uh, they go to the man who was healed himself, his very their very son, which kind of puts their son in, in a precarious predicament as well. Now he has to testify for himself without the help of their witnessing. Um, so the, the parents here are, are a little bit cowardly, uh, but let's read on. So these are verses 24 through 29. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have already told you and you did not listen. What? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. All right, so if you notice there in verse 25, he says, I was blind, but now I see. This is very popular, right? So this is actually part of a song, a worship song. I once was blind, but now I see. Um, amazing grace, right? Uh, so we see here that uh, we can be healed of our blindness. We can all take a page from the blind man. We may not have been physically blind, but maybe we were spiritually blind. And this is also something that Jesus is going to address with the Pharisees, their spiritual blindness. This is what we read about at the very end of this chapter. Uh, so because they are blind, they cannot recognize that Moses is also somebody who spoke with God. Uh, he says, they say, we are Moses' disciples. We know that Moses spoke to God, but about this man, we don't know. Well, they should know uh, because he's healing people. He's doing the works of God and they still cannot see it. They are still blinded by the very law that they hold. Uh, that because Jesus is doing these things on the Sabbath, they think that is going against God's commandments. And because of that, they condemn him. But in the law, it does not state that you cannot do works of the law. It does not say you cannot perform miracles. Uh, so again, their short-sightedness is kind of their downfall. All right, let's read on verses 30 through 36. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And it's very important that we understand where Jesus comes from. He is not only born in Bethlehem, as by the prophets would say that the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem, but he is also from heaven. He descended from heaven to earth, and this is where his origin is. It's very important we understand that, and also important to know that the Pharisees don't understand that. They know nothing about Jesus. They don't know anything about his origin and this is very important in the Gospel of John, that we understand John 1.1, 1, 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and then verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling with us. Uh, so we know where Jesus comes from. He comes from the Father, right? He, he was with God, and he is also God at the same time. All right, so we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. All right, so it's interesting here that they think this man was steeped in sin at birth. However, 
What does that mean for them? Were they not born into sin? Uh, in the psalm, David says, I was sinful in my mother's womb. So how dare they think that they are sinless and uh, think that they are above this man because he was born blind? Um, again, uh, they are blind, but in a much different way, which Jesus will point out. So the next section has been called spiritual blindness. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. All right, so I think this man knows. However, uh, he says, Tell me who it is. I'm going to believe you because I at least think you're a prophet. You're a man who speaks God's words. And if God is speaking to me through you, then you're going to tell me who the Son of Man is. Obviously, Jesus is going to be pointing to himself. All right, so now let's read the last few verses of this chapter, verses 37 through 41. Jesus said, You have now seen him, and in fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who will see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. All right, so we see reference to spiritual blindness here. Verse 39 says, So that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Obviously, not literally, but the Pharisees here are very blind, yet they claim they can see. They claim to know God. They claim to know God's word. And because they claim to know him, they claim to see him. Not physically, but claim to see him spiritually, yet they don't. They don't even see him physically when he's right there in front of him in the form of Jesus. Uh, we see that this man acknowledges him as Lord and he worships him. Now, this is very important that Jesus receives worship. We see and read about angels receiving worship and men that are filled with the Holy Spirit receiving worship, but also denying being worshipped because they are not God. But Jesus here receives worship himself, and this is acceptable to him. Jesus doesn't rebuke the man for worshiping him. If Jesus was not God, he would have to rebuke him for worshiping him because he is worshiping somebody other than God. Uh, so the Pharisees can't see that. Uh, people who are blinded by Satan, people who are blinded by this world, cannot see Jesus as God, and they will continue to not see Jesus as God. But we of us who believe, who know the scriptures, who know the work of God, and that the work of God was being done through Jesus, we will see him. We will see him in the spiritual. We will be able to recognize the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, which brings about cleansing in our lives. All right, so the big takeaway here is I once was blind, but now I can see. Uh, now Jesus wants to give us spiritual sight so that we can see uh, these spirits at work in the world. Uh, there is one true clean spirit, the Holy Spirit, and we should be able to recognize him once he has opened our eyes. Uh, but there are many unclean spirits that wish to lead us astray, wish to lead us back to the mud, to filth, to uncleanliness, to impurity. And we must keep our eyes open. And once we claim to have our eyes open, let's keep out, keep alert uh, for Satan and all of these unclean spirits. Uh, because once we have the knowledge, we're able to defeat them, much like Jesus defeated them in the Gospels. And once we receive our sight, let us not go back to our uncleanliness. And that is my encouragement for you today, my brothers and sisters that we remain in Jesus as he remains in us and he is in the Father. And let us remember these things as we live out our lives, never falling back to spiritual blindness, but always uh, keeping our eyes open for Jesus and all that he continues to do in our lives. Amen? Amen. Give me a fist bump.